Well, good morning, New City. What a journey we have already had this morning, a mom and daughter being baptized together, an altar full of people praying together. And man, 50, over 50 people that joined the church last year. We are, we are on a roll, and the Lord is up to something good. And so it's my honor and privilege to be on the platform this morning, to be able to share with you this morning. I want to thank our lead pastors, our breathtaking shepherds, Pastor Gilbert and Mona Kelly, um, just for all that they do in this house, for all that they are, and um, for just always being the best shepherds that they know to be, that God has ordained them to be. So this morning, I am, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to risk it. I'm preaching without notes. I have no notes at all this morning. Um, I am going to read scripture because that's the most important thing that I could do with this microphone as we gather together this morning. Um, but I am going to share a bit of my story. And before I jump in, I, I'm, I'm aware that over the last couple of years, I've, I've sprinkled, I've kind of peppered my story into some of the times that I've preached or maybe when I've been exhorting or maybe in conversations. Um, I know at the women's conference two years ago, I shared it pretty much in full, but um, most of you weren't here because it was just the women, in, and I can't say most, half of you weren't there because it was the women in the room, and we've had a lot of people um, come into our church since. And so... I kind of disclaim this morning that if you've heard pieces of this story, perhaps you've heard it in full, perhaps you're one of those people that have um, journeyed closely with me and you could probably tell the story um, just as well as I could. I want to encourage you this morning to allow the Lord to speak to you. It's really my story, but more than that, it's my story of what he has done in my life. It's really his story of his goodness and his mercy. And we all have a story. All of us have a story. And we could sit here for hours and days and talk about the goodness of God. And the beauty of that is even when I just said, we all have a story, some of you, by nature, your first response was, well, I don't really have a story. If you know him, you have a story. And the beauty of sharing your testimony is is other people's story trigger in a, trigger in a good way, <laughs> trigger those memories in us to go, oh yeah, me too. I've seen God do that. I've seen God be faithful here. Or it also can stir faith in us to go, if he did it for you, he can do it for me. And so we all have a story. If you know the Lord, you've got a story. If you don't know the Lord yet, your story is waiting to be written. There is a story that has happened in your life, but I believe that when we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, as we begin to trust in him and follow him, life truly begins to happen. And there's the before Christ and the after Christ story of our lives. But speaking of stories, I do want, because I have watched this so many times, and every single time it stirs me up, it was so powerful. During our Christmas Eve production, I can't thank the team enough that anyone that had any participation in Christmas Eve 2023, my goodness, what an incredible, incredible time we shared together. The whole, pro yeah, you can clap. The whole production was just so amazing, but there was this part at the end, it was the culmination of the entire production, where we had people share what we called a pro-testimony that they were protesting the goodness of God in the best way. They were sharing their pro-testimony of who God has been in their life. It was just a snapshot, but my goodness, it was a snapshot that echoed big results. And we're going to watch a clip of that. We're actually going to watch that whole segment. But I want you to know, this was kind of the aha moment for so many people in the audience, that it, it clicked when they would see somebody that they knew because it's important to get to know people in the rows and not just say hello during the meet and greet. But when, when they connected with somebody, when they knew the person coming up to the, that was next, and you'll know what I'm talking about, they had a signs, um, that they went, oh, these are their stories. So I want you to know, giving you the, the blues clues ahead of time, these were their stories written by them 
We put it on the poster for them, but this was their wordage based off of who God has been in their life. So I want you to sit back and enjoy and let the Lord stir in your heart the excitement, his faithfulness, his goodness, celebrating all that God can do, will do, and has done in our lives. Let's watch this clip from the Christmas Eve service. Oh, come, oh, you unfaithful. Unstable, come. No, you are not alone. Oh, come, barren and wet. 
Come on. Woo! Did you see yourself in there somewhere? My goodness, so powerful. So this morning, I'm watching the clock, and it's already, it's already almost time to go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my time, but I'm not going to rush. So amen. Some of you caught that. I'm going to take my time, but I ain't going to rush. So this morning, I want to take you back to three years ago, 2020. I often joke that there's so many of us that are triggered and need to make a therapy appointment just by the mention of the year 2020. And maybe it was a great year for you, and for that, I, I'm so th thankful, for real. But it was, a, it was a tough year for the church, the local church, New City Church Church. It was a tough year for our lead pastors. It was a tough year for so many. It was a tough year for me. It was the toughest year of my life. And so I'm going to take you back there. I do want to stop and just, and, and again, I don't have notes. I'm just sharing from my heart today. Um, I gave my life to the Lord at the age of five and really, truly fell in love with Jesus as much as my five-year-old mind could comprehend and probably even more than I understood. I loved Jesus. I had the honor and privilege of growing up within the four walls of an amazing local body church in, in, in Florida, an amazing church, and moved here as an 18-year-old to do our internship in Bible college and began serving. I don't know a life, I don't have a memory of a life before Jesus. I've just loved Jesus, and he's always been faithful. And for, to the best of my knowledge and in the best of my, my choices that I could, I, I've followed him. Not perfectly, because none of us are perfect, but I say that to let you know I've done this Jesus thing for a long time. I've done this I've had the honor and privilege of doing this full-time ministry thing for a long time. So the church, Jesus, the word of God is no stranger to me. And for that, I'm thankful. But three years ago, everything came to a head in my life. I was battling clinical depression, clinical depression, diagnosable clinical depression diagnosed clinical depression. I say that because sometimes we can just flippantly throw that. I need you to know it was, it was for real. And I'm not saying other people's is not, but diagnosable. And generalized anxiety. And I had been struggling way longer than I even realized. I'm a, I'm a go-getter. I'm a helper. I'm a supporter. I'm a help everybody else. And I love people, and I love ministry, and, and depression isn't one size fits all. It doesn't look the same for everybody. Anxiety doesn't look the same. There's some overlaps, but I wasn't the person that wasn't able to get out of bed, and I wasn't that person. I, I was showing up. I probably needed to go get in bed. But I was saying yes and pushing myself to the side. Self-care is such a, a taboo word in the Christian world because we can look at it and be like, oh, there's no such thing as self-care. Well, you, you can't love others if you don't love yourself. That's biblical. You can't pour from an empty cup. And if you are, you're pouring from your own strength, and that's dangerous. So I had been struggling with depression. I knew I had been struggling with depression. It, it ebbs and flows. It comes and goes. But I will say at, uh, three years ago, I couldn't remember the last time it had ebbed and flowed. It had just flowed. But I was showing up. We were holding our church together the best that we could, trying to make everybody happy and follow Jesus at the same time. That doesn't work. We were doing the best that we could in, the, in this pandemic. That It was all of our first pandemic. And, and there were so many things going on, disappointments in my life. I I had been waiting for marriage, still waiting for marriage, and thought I had met the one. I'm going to be real, real with y'all today. Thought I had met the one, had all the signs, all the things that people would say, when it's the one, this will happen. I had green checks across the whole thing. And as quick as that relationship started, it ended. And that was it. It was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Church was a question mark. 
didn't know what was going to happen with us, didn't know what my job. I had just transitioned out of 10 incredible years of youth ministry, thinking that I would be a youth pastor for the rest of my life. True story. Transitioned into a new role here as experienced pastor, which was a guinea pig experiment for us. We were literally figuring it out as we went. I just knew the Lord had said, it's time I grieved, legitimately grieved step. Anyone ever transitioned from a career that you're like, this is it? And the Lord says, mm, let's flip the script. Grieved uh, for a year that I was hanging my hat up in youth ministry, but being obedient to what I felt urgently the Lord was asking me to do. I transitioned officially, handed the baton to our incredible youth team, Pastor Zach and Ashley Booker and Pastor Zach and Desiree Jeffries. And Pastor Gaffar, he leads our worship team with the youth. At the end of 2019, stepped into an unknown role in 2020, and then a pandemic hit, and we didn't even have church. So church was a question mark for me. Depression was at its highest. Anxiety was at its highest. And I didn't even realize it. Like, I knew I was depressed, but I didn't know I was depressed. I was in survival mode trying to push through, trying to hold everything together. In our first large gathering that we had at 2020 was our sisterhood conference. I'll make this part short and sweet. I was scheduled to be on a panel on the stage. I wasn't preaching. I wasn't leading. I was just supposed to answer two questions. When was a time that the Lord showed up in your life? I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. When was a time that you were scared but the Lord showed up in your life? I had no answer to that question. Not because he's not good, not because he hadn't showed up, because I was spiraling in that moment and didn't even realize it. I dismissed myself from the panel, which was such a shameful moment for me, it shouldn't have been. But I was like, I've never missed a speaking engagement. Here I am at my own church, and I can't even get on the stage. I was having a panic attack is really what was happening. Full-blown panic attack. Pulled myself off. I said, something's not right. And I began to break down in a room in the, in the Peachtree City location, in a back room with one of my dearest friends, Pastor Desiree. It was the strangest thing, and some of you will relate to this. It was as if my body said, it, we're done. I began to sob and I, I mean sob, the tears, hot tears would not stop flowing from my face. And I started making these negative pro proclamations that I knew somewhere in my heart weren't true, but they felt so real in that moment. I said, I'm done with ministry. I'll never preach again. I'm a fake. I'm a fraud. I, don't even, I can't even function, let alone get up there. I mean, just the, the, the judgment and the accusations of the enemy. And I began to break. And it was so strange because I was sobbing, but I literally had no emotion. My body was releasing all this emotion, but my emotions, my soul felt numb. I went home from the conference that night. I was smart enough to call my, my therapist. I said, I think something's not right. Did an emergency session with my therapist. I'll fast forward the next couple days. We're very turbulent. I went to sleep. I had had a series of panic attacks at my house by myself, finally fell asleep, and I woke up in a panic attack. And I thought, now listen, this girl likes to sleep. <laughs> Ain't no enemy coming after me and going to start robbing me of my sleep with some panic attacks. If you've ever had a panic attack, it's, ser it's serious. And in that moment, I believe, led by the Holy Spirit, because I... I think I'm just grateful that I've walked with people long enough. I've seen where these things can lead. I knew that if I don't get help, this is going to get worse. So I Googled Christian mental health clinics. I wanted to go somewhere that I was going to have biblically based stuff. I knew I didn't need to go check into the hospital. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you have done or need to do, please do it. You just heard a pastor say it. Please do it. I just wasn't at that point, but I knew if I didn't get help, I may be checking into the hospital. 
So I called this clinic that popped up on Google, and all the while I thought, they're gonna tell me I'm not a good candidate. That I'm not, I'm not like, okay, you're having a tough time, but sweetie, you need to go make a, session, a counseling session and maybe drink some more water, eat some more protein. And I was in denial the whole time, thinking I'm surely not that bad. Like, I just need to sleep. I just need to get some rest and I'll be okay. And I'll pull my bootstraps back up and show up to church on Sunday and everything will be good. The pastor that took the call said, you need to get here. It sounds like you're exactly the type of person this program is created for. I said, okay. The Lord made a way for me to go. I hung up my hat for 30 days and checked into a mental health clinic with an incredible team of doctors, psychiatrists, psychiatrists, medicine, therapy, and other people who were in very broken situations right alongside of me. One of my favorite stories to tell, and you may have heard this before, is the first night I thought about eating dinner in my room because I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. There's people there that had been through some rough stuff. See, here's the thing. The enemy is, is, is so good at binding you up, then making you feel stupid for being bound, and then he'll tell you you're not even as bound as you are. It's a, it's a mind trap. It's a mind game. I'm in the mental health clinic the first night already evaluating myself. That's, let's leave that up to the doctors first off evaluating myself if I'm even bad enough to be here. Already made it in, already did the search, already had everything taken away from me, checked in. Am I good enough to be here? Like bad enough to be here, I should say. And so I walk out to this picnic table full of people eating dinner and everyone's telling their stories. It's kind of like an AA meeting. I'm not making fun of that. We're all like, well, what got you here? You know, here, Here's my story. And I hear these wild, wild stories. And I'm like, what am I doing here? Minimizing my own struggle. Because the pastor inside of me, and that's a beautiful thing, but pastors have to be fed too. The pastor inside of me is automatically like, oh, well, maybe I need to pour into them. Girl, sit down. And so it got to my turn, and they said, well, what are you here for? I was like, well, I'm really depressed, <laughs> and I've had some anxiety and a couple panic attacks. And I automatically started to say, I know I'm not as bad off as some of you. And this person leaned across the table and grabbed my hand. I will never forget this. And they said, honey, whatever got you here is okay. Pain is pain, and you're safe here. And I immediately thought, okay, it's time to heal. And I went through the next 30 days. It was a beautiful, incredible journey, but the hardest thing that I have ever done in my entire life. The, the place that I went to is called Honey Lake. It's an amazing, amazing program, beautiful property. If I, if I share all the things, you'd be like, wow, that sounds like a vacation. Well, they need to make it nice so you'll at least stay because you are doing the hardest heart work you will ever do. You putting it all on the table. And so I went through 30 days of sharing with strangers and, and opening myself up and facing things that I had never faced, that I had diminished my whole life thinking, other people have it worse than me. That wasn't that bad. Again, 2020, it was like the perfect storm that shook up all of those seeds of fear, all of those deeply rooted insecurities, shook it up, and it was the perfect storm for it to finally come out. Oftentimes, people will ask me when I share my story, so what was it? Like, I had a full-blown breakdown. Full-blown breakdown. Couldn't function. I truly, truly never thought I would preach again. I would think about here, I would think about the church or preaching, and I would get physical anxiety. I was just so burned out. And people will say, well, what got you there? Like, what was it? Was it the breakup? Was it the pandemic? You know what it was? It was humanity.
It was living on this side of eternity. Sure, there were circumstances and situation that might have elevated that moment. But I look back, it was actually the kindest, the kindest thing the Lord could have ever walked me through. Because it brought me to healing. And it brought me to him. I'll never forget one of my first Sundays back. I didn't even know. I, I, I could hardly walk in the building. And it wasn't that the church did anything. Let me cover us. It wasn't that the church did anything. It was just, I, this is my job. This is my church, but this is also my job. And I was just, Pastor Gilbert and Pastor Mona and Pastor Kathy, the whole team, were, the elders were so incredibly graceful, way more graceful probably than I deserved. But I will never forget, is Dr. O in here? He wasn't here. There he is. Dr. Philip, Dr. Philip can read me from afar. And I don't know if anyone had shared with him where I had been, but I felt safe enough because for a long time I didn't tell nobody. Not because I was ashamed, but because I was still in the moment and I just needed the Lord and me and my safe people to walk me through. It wasn't something I was putting on Facebook for everybody to comment on. I'll never forget talking to Dr. Philip and I told him where I had, I had been and I said, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what the future looks like. And I, I can't believe I was even there. And he said this thing. I told him earlier I was going to share this. He probably doesn't even remember what he said, but I have never forgotten it. He put his arm on my shoulder and he said, Jenny, the Lord is not disappointed in you having a human experience. He died on the cross for that human experience. I will never forget that. The experienced pastor was having a whole experience with Jesus. And this morning, I could go on, I could tell a story after story of the things that I learned at Honey Lake, the people that I shared that experience with, the long journey of healing after. We're three years in, and there are still every once in a while ripple effects because I'm human. Do I believe I'm healed? I do. I stand on that. But I'm not ignorant enough to think if I don't put myself in the same situation, if I put myself in the same situation, in the same mindset, that I won't have the same result. Sometimes we, people say, just pray about it and, and get in the word. Hey, yes, please. I'm not, I'm not diminishing that. Get in the word, pray about it, surround it. But you got to take some steps too. And, and this morning, I'm here to tell you that whatever your situation is, I, I, I actually don't feel like sharing this morning any more of the story that was behind the story. Because what we can do, and although that is important, and I believe there's a time and a place for me to even maybe share with you personally and us swap stories. But sometimes what that does is we begin to compare to each other. And you go, oh, well, I wish mine was just panic attacks. Or I wish mine was just depression. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And I wouldn't wish to walk in your shoes. All I know is that I've walked a journey and it was the darkest journey of my life. The hardest journey of my life. But I'm here to tell about it. And if, God forbid, if that ever comes back around, I believe that it won't. I pray that it won't. But if it does, he will be faithful. At recovery, when I came home and I was doing all this therapy and seeing my psychiatrist and trying to get, I was fighting so hard to not let that happen again. And see, here's the thing. I think, not, not always, but a lot of people, the question of, well, what, what led you to that? How did that happen? Is because we want to make sure that don't ever happen again and it doesn't happen to us. Humanity. That's what happened. But God has been faithful. And he will continue to be faithful. It took about a year for me to get back to full function. I spent a lot of nights at Pastor Sean and Dina's house. I basically moved back in with them. Because I didn't want to be alone. I shouldn't have been alone. Because depression isolates you already. And then when you live alone, that depression gets real loud. And the sick thing about depression is it makes you want to shut everybody out when you really need people. It was a long year. 
of recovery. I'm still, again, I'm still, there's still areas that I'm growing in. But the Lord is good. I was supposed to read this scripture and I completely forgot. So I'm going to chalk that one up to the Holy Spirit. Because we got a Bible reading church. And I can't forget to read the word because, again, this is the most important part of my message. Psalm 27, we're going to read the whole thing. And then I'm going to begin to close. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Ooh. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil do, doers assail me to eat up my flesh, <clears throat> my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Somebody needs to tell their heart right here, right now. My heart shall not fear. Mm. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in this shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you, ha oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my own adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. This one right here, we land in the plain. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Listen, I could just read that scripture, close my Bible, and we could wring our hands and shout hallelujah because his word is good. I can share my story and pieces of it, and that's amazing, but it doesn't compare to the goodness of the word of God. He's good, and I'm here to testify about it. It's a snapshot. There's so many stories off of this one story that I'm sharing with you this morning. Before I close, I do want to share this one thing because it's my second favorite story from Honey Lake, and some of you have heard this. So the second Sunday we were there, because this was during 2020, so church services were still online. The night before, they, they realized that they were having internet connection issues, and so they have those too, not just us. So they said, I don't think we're going to be able to attend church in the morning. And everyone there was like, I love going to church. I was like, hmm. I love going to church, too. <laughs> I do love going to church, but it was tough. And one of the patients leaned over to me, and they said, well, you're a pastor, aren't you? Can't you preach tomorrow? <laughs> this is a true story. With this Bible in my hand, true story. I said, um, I'm a patient here. <laughs> and they said, but aren't you a pastor, too? Not this week. Nor next week, or the next three weeks, actually. And then I remembered it's not about a title. It's about who he is and what he's done, and it's his word coming through me anyway. And so I sat outside at a raggedy picnic table on a Sunday morning in October or November of 2020, and I preached the most broken message from my heart that was one of the most powerful moments, I believe, because I was surrendered to God. 
And the call of God on your life isn't dependent on situations and circumstances. It's, it's dependent on his spirit. So if he's called you to be a mom in the middle of your situation, you're going to be able to be the best mom by his spirit that you can be. If he's called you to be a pastor, you will be a pastor in corporate America. You'll be a, a pastor at the bus stop in your neighborhood. If he's called you to be a teacher, you'll teach at church. You'll teach in the schools. You'll teach somebody in the line at the grocery store how to do something better. Because the call of God, the wiring and, and, and the thing that God has placed inside of you is not dependent on your own strength. When it is, it's not God. When it is, when it's his, it's good. It's effortless. Some of you are holding back because you think you're not good enough or that God has placed something inside of you. You could be a mechanic. You can be a doctor. You can be a therapist. Those are fresh on my mind because of this story. You can be a lawyer. You can be a judge. You can be a, 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 a garbage man, woman. They call it something else now. Sanitation person, thank you. I was like, let me be politically correct, not if anybody, anybody up here. I probably already have anyways. When Jesus has placed it in you, he will make sure that it comes forth. By his spirit. His spirit. So I shared, we, we watched that Christmas Eve snapshot I shared a snapshot of my story. And now I'm going to do my posters. They don't look as pretty as the ones that we had at Christmas Eve, but, and I'm hoping that this this works because I haven't tested it because it happened at like 11 o'clock last night. (laughs) Lord of mercy. Let me not get a paper cut. I was pouring from an empty cup. I hope there's no typos on here. (laughs) I was pouring from an empty cup, trying to do things in my own strength, things that I was good at and things that I was not. But now I remember he is my source. Whether that be my job, my family, my joy, my healing, listen, if you're struggling today, go get help. I will never not say that. Go get help. Help to you may look different than it did to me. I, think, I don't think every single person has to go check into Honey Lake. I don't think that's everybody's journey. But I will say everybody could. Because life is tough. Anyone could benefit from it. But that may not be your journey. And that's Okay. Get a team of, of doctors or, or therapists or prayer warriors around, around you. Work out. Do something that you enjoy. Get filled back up by his spirit and his word. I got creative on this one. I was engulfed in a dark cloud of depression. I think it was dark. If you've ever struggled with depression, it's not just a bad day. I mean, there are bad days, but it's a series. It's, it's a fog is what it's often described as. as. If you can't see, you've got brain fog, you can't function. It's not just a, well, just get up and do better tomorrow. You know how, let me be careful, because there are moments to push and encourage, and there are moments to sit and be and pray. Sometimes people would say to me, well, just get up and do it. And then when the next day I couldn't get up and do it, then guess what? I felt even worse. One of the most beautiful things about Honey Lake to me and the team of people and the tribe of people that I have in this house and in my life was when they would just go, I see you and I'm praying for you. I don't understand. I don't have all the answers. The answers that I do come up with, they might work and they may not, but I know who is the answer. So I was engulfed for a long time, engulfed in a dark cloud. It was dark. Somebody that carries Jesus on the inside was still struggling with an earthly experience. But now hope has become my anchor talks about in the Word of God that hope is an anchor to your soul. 
It's an anchor in the storm. It's an anchor to keep you set, to keep you steady when the winds blow and the, and the skies are dark. It's an anchor to your soul. I had lost hope. I love Jesus. I worship Jesus. But my heart was aching. It was sick. It was, it was hurting. And with each disappointment, it chipped away more and more and more at the hope. And so from my mouth, I was smart enough to say, God is good. But in my heart, I was like, you need to help me connect with that. Is that too real? I, I was smart enough to say, I'm going to worship you. But in my heart, I was like, woo, you're making this hard. But I'm a trust. Sometimes I was blaming him. And he was like, well, if you made some different decisions sometimes. It's another message for another day. I was fighting through anxiety's grip. I was fighting through anxiety's grip, trying to dodge it, trying to do all the things, trying, striving, striving to dodge this. I don't want this to happen. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I got to fix this. And I got, it is a very, 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 and I, I hope this connects with somebody because I believe if you connect with this, I truly believe there's freedom on the other side for you. I'm rushing the clock at this point. It is a weird place to be, to be so incredibly deeply numb from depression where you feel nothing, but their anxiety is and you feel everything. You're so numb, but yet you're feeling all the things. How do you reconcile that? I feel numb, but I, I don't. It was these two worlds. And again, this might not be your story. You may not understand this. I may not understand yours, but I know Jesus is good. I'm just sharing a snapshot of me. I was fighting through anxiety's grip. But now I am learning, still learning, to rest in his love. But now I'm learning to rest in his love. Move when he says move. Take that thought captive when he brings it to your mind. Speak scripture, pray, worship, trust, rest in his love, to rest in his love. I was hiding behind walls of disappointment, hiding behind walls, thinking I was one of the most transparent people ever. And I am, I'm very transparent, but I was guarding my own heart in so many ways because I thought we ain't doing that again. We're not trying that one again hiding behind walls of disappointment. But now I trust that he is my protector and the lifter of my head. Now I trust that he is my protector and the lifter of my head. We guard our heart best when it's in his hands. We guard our hearts best when our hearts are in his hands because he's our shield, he's our protector. And you know what all this reminds me of as we close? Prayer team, I know y'all already worked today. You already poured out. Can you come back up? And as you're walking up, prayer team, I pray in the name of Jesus that your own hearts and your own minds and your own bodies are healed, strengthened, recovered, renewed, restored. Joy would hit you from the bottom and the depths of your life all the way overflowing. I pray that for you in the name of Jesus. Because y'all up here serving every time. Sometimes you may want to respond to the altar call and you got somebody else you're praying for. He's your source. This reminds me. Can we all stand? All of this. My story, your story, the stories we saw at Christmas Eve. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound, I would sing, but I'm crying already. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And this morning, wherever you're at in your walk, maybe you have similar, similar things in your journey that I had in mind. Maybe it's totally different. I see you this morning. I see you. 
But more than me, he sees you. He intimately sees you. He sees the tears. He sees the hurt. He sees the wondering, the wandering, and the wondering. He sees the pain. He sees the disappointment. He sees the waiting, the frustration, the dreams that have been abandoned because you feel like you've waited too long. He sees you. And I'm here to tell you, we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you're in the hardest fight of your life, or if you're taking a breather and it's good, he's there, and he's faithful. And so this morning as I close out, I want to encourage you. If you need strength today, I'm not going to box that in what that looks like. If you need strength today, I want you to come up here and have somebody pray with you. We're going to pray that the Lord would strengthen, that you would recognize that he is your source. Maybe you need to take a step and get help from someone, somewhere. I don't know. But if you're hurting today, if you need strength, or perhaps today, this is the invitation. If you want to give your life to Christ for the first time, if you say, my whole world is hurting, my whole world is confusing, I've never, I don't know this Jesus that you're talking about, I'm here to tell you that he's real, he loves you, he died for you, he wants a relationship with you, and all you got to do is say yes to him, and you will begin the journey of your life. Not always easy. Bumps dark times, but he's good. So if you have a prayer that you say, you know what, I need strength today, or you want to give your life to Christ, these, these altars are open. We're going to crank the music for just a few moments, and then we'll close out. Thank you this morning for having me, for letting me share. Let's take this the next few moments. If you're not responding to the altar call, pray for those that are, or pray for somebody in your family or in your world that, that, needs, that needs a breakthrough. Amen? He's good, and his grace is amazing. Thank you, church.